And before we get started, Amy and I wanted to thank um, the NECASC as well as Mass Wildlife for providing the funding for this uh, very exciting project. Um, we're really excited to share some of the results from a study where we used a novel Uh, we used a novel tag technique um, to measure thermal environment that brook trout actually experience in the wild. Until this technology was available, the only way to examine relationships between stream temperature and various fish metrics, such as growth survival and ultimately population persistence, was by estimating what water temperature fish experienced in the wild. This technology lets us tell or tells us exactly what temperature fish experience in the wild. Um, so why brook trout? Brook trout is the only native trout species over most of its historic, historic range, which extends from the Appalachians up through the Canadian Maritimes. They're sought after by anglers, and as the apex predator in most small streams, they're ecologically important. Also because brook trout typically occupy only high quality cold water habitat, many state agencies use them to delineate cold water fisheries resources for management purposes. However, despite ongoing conservation and restoration activities, brook trout currently only occupy about 70% of their historical range. Particularly at the southern end, they occur mostly in high elevation streams that which tend to be cooler. Anthropogenic influences combined with extreme weather events lead to increased stream temperature and are thought to be the leading cause of population decline. The reason it's important to measure individual thermal experience is because management decisions are often based from regional models which don't typically account for local variation in stream conditions or the fish's response to those stream conditions. For example, we conducted a long-term research project over 20 years where we tagged tens of thousands of fish to examine how factors such as stream temperature and flow influence population persistence. Those data were used to create models to predict predict occupancy over broad scales. In this manuscript, the authors use that model to demonstrate how a projected two degree increase in air temperature in, in July results in 42% in of cold water streams in Massachusetts becoming too warm to support brook trout. Regional models are good, but what they tell us is how the average fish will respond to the average thermal conditions within streams. This isn't to knock broad scale models, but we do need to acknowledge that they're limited by the amount of available data. And even when we have lots of fish and stream temperature data, the stream temperature loggers may not be effective at characterizing the thermal habitat that the fish actually experience. Current literature indicates chronic exposure above 22 degrees leads to sublethal effects, for example, reductions in growth. Um, that the probability of occurrence declines dramatically at temperatures above 23 degrees and that temperatures at or above 25 degrees are lethal. However, we do know there's populations persisting in streams at or above those temperature thresholds. There are thermal coping mechanisms brook trout could use such as adaptation or cold water refuge seeking um, behavior that currently, but currently data, those data are difficult to collect and not available for brook trout. If they can use mechanisms to persist in warm streams, perhaps warm streams thought not capable of supporting brook trout would be candidates for protection or restoration. However, however examining fish thermal habitat choice in the wild is very challenging. Even when we tag and recapture lots and lots of individual fish with conventional methods such as electrofishing and pit tags, and construct detailed habitat maps, we still don't know what thermal conditions the fish are actually experiencing. Fortunately, the miniaturization of novel temperature recording tags has made it feasible to record thermal experience of stream fish. We designed a study where we impl implanted wild brook trout with temperature recording tags, released them back to the wild for the summer, recollected them in the fall, and then measured their thermal tolerance in the lab. And we did this over two years. In both years, thermal tolerance was measured the day after the fish were captured in the fall. The fish were then recovered for 60 days in cold water and thermal tolerance was measured, was measured again. In 2021, fish were held in cold water for another 21 days, after which a suite of physiological parameters were measured. But before we initiated our field study, there were a couple key things that we needed to know. 
First, we needed to understand how quickly implanted tags reacted to changes in stream temperature conditions. So to figure this out, we implanted lab fish with temperature recording tags set to record temperature every second, and then subjected those fish to rapid te temperature fluctuations. And as a reminder, fish are ectotherms, so their body temperature is equivalent to the water temperature they are experiencing. We just don't know how quickly body, body temperatures equilibrate to water temperature. And so what we found, luckily, is that even in really, really large fish, fish much bigger than we were tagging in the field, is that the tags recorded to tank water temperatures within 30 seconds. We also needed to know something about acclimation and adaptation in brook trout. There's literature for other fish species, including other salmonid species, that indicate fish can persist in warm temperatures. <laughs> To determine if brook trout might persist when faced with increased thermal regimes, we conducted a series of lab experiments where we measured whether brook trout can adapt in the long term, basically over generations, or can they acclimate over shorter within generation timescales to warmer stream conditions. To think about how people relate to temperature, um, when it's 40 degrees out in the fall, we think it's really cold because we're acclimated to warm summer temperatures. But if we have a 40 degree day in February, Many of us think it's warm because we're acclimated to the much colder winter temperatures. To conduct our short and long-term lab experiments, we collected wild brook trout um, from a nearby trout stream and spawned them in the lab and reared their eggs and offspring at three different temperatures. The coldest temperature is the daily average temperature from our long-term field site, which I'll refer to as plus zero or ambient and is shown here in green. And the two warmer temperatures were two degrees above ambient, shown in blue, and four degrees above ambient, shown here in this orangey color. Down here on the left is our wet lab where fish were spawned and reared. The plot on the top right shows the typical thermal regime that fish were reared under. So to determine if brook trout acclimated to warmer rearing temperatures, we subjected some fish from each temperature treatment to a thermal challenge in the fall of their first year of life. To measure thermal tolerance, we use a technique called critical thermal maximum or CTMAX. CTMAX is accomplished by placing fish in an experimental tank and increasing the tank's temperature by two degrees an hour in a linear fashion. When the fish loses equilibrium, basically it rolls over and can't right itself, um, the fish is removed from the tank and placed in a tank filled with cold water to recover. The temperature at which the fish rolled over is its CTMAX value. But because we use a slow yet ecologically relevant, ecologically relevant ramp rate, we calculated degree minutes from the time the ramp started until the time the fish loses equilibrium and use that as our metric of CT max. What we found is that fish reared at warmer temperatures did demonstrate increased thermal tolerance over fish reared at colder temperatures. On the x-axis is rearing treatment and on the y-axis is thermal tolerance displayed by each treatment. However, because this was the first generation of fish reared under these thermal conditions, we suspected this increased thermal tolerance was transient and therefore just an acclimation effect. To determine if this was an acclimation response, we took fish from the two warmest treatments, moved them to the same temperature as the coldest treatment, and measured thermal tolerance at several time points after being transferred to cold water. Each panel on this plot shows thermal tolerance on the y-axis for all three treatments listed on the x-axis. And each panel shows the number of days after being moved to cold water. For example, the first panel is three days after being moved to cold water, the second one seven days after being moved to cold water, and so on. And so what we saw is that by 42 days after being moved to cold water, the fish from the warmer treatments have the same thermal tolerance as fish from the coldest group. This shows that the fish were acclimated to warm water, but they lost that acclimation response over time. So we know that in the lab where we can force fish to experience warm or cold temperatures, we can force thermal acclimation. But in the wild, fish not only have the option to acclimate or potentially adapt, but where it exists, they can take advantage of within stream thermal variability and move to cold water refugia. For my portion of this presentation, I'm going to focus on what we did in the field, what we learned from tagged fish that we recollected in the fall, and how thermal experience in the wild related to thermal tolerance measured in the lab. And then Amy's going to talk about 
the second thermal tolerance test, um, and then some other lethal sampling we did at the end. <clears throat> to determine to what extent Brookchild took advantage of within stream thermal variability, we conducted a two year field study in six study areas across four streams that we knew to contain brook trout. In the spring, we deployed temperature loggers throughout the study areas in an attempt to measure the amount of thermal variability within each stream. And we implanted fish with tags that record water temperature that the fish actually experience. In the fall, we collected as many of those fish, as many of those tagged fish as we could and transported them back to the Ponte lab where thermal tolerance was measured the day after collection in the fall. Down here is where our study sites were located. Um, they're listed here in descending order from our coldest site to our warmest site. So we had two sites here in Drybrook up in Bernerston and Gill, Massachusetts. Um, two warmer sites here on Lionsbrook in Wendell and two tributaries to the Quabbin Reservoir, Atherton Brook and Underhill Brook. So again, our coldest site was here at Drybrook and our warmest site was here just below Ruggles Pond um, on Lions Brook. And just to let you know, this color scheme will stay consistent throughout my and Amy's part of the presentations. We use backpack electrofishing in the fall to, um, to collect fish for tagging, or sorry, we use backpack electrofishing in June to collect fish for tagging, and then again in the fall to recollect fish. In June 2021, um, we also pit tagged extra fish beyond the fish that were implanted with temperature tags to help determine if there was an impact of temperature tagging fish on over summer survival. In both years, we attempted to maximize the number of large fish captured in June. And the reason we tried to maximize the number of large fish captured in June is because the tags, the temperature tags themselves are quite large. Shown here next to the penny is a pit tag, which is inert and simply returns a unique ID number when interrogated by a pit tag recorder, a uh, pit tag reader, and the larger temperature tag which has a battery and memory and can store just over 43,000 events. And the event being a date, time, and body temperature of the tagged fish. Um, the temperature recording tags are great, but they do um, have a couple drawbacks. One is they're quite large, meaning that the um, smallest fish we could tag was about 125 millimeters. And they're also pretty expensive. Each tag was $300, which meant that we could only afford 120 tags each year so we put out 20 tags in each one of our six study sites each year. Most of the data Amy and I are going to show today is from 2021 because most of the tagged fish um, from 2022 are still alive in our wet lab and we can't retrieve the thermal tag data until we euthanize the fish to extract the tag. In 2021 we were able to recapture about 30 percent of our pit tag and temperature tag fish and in 2022 um, we've recaptured about 25% of our tagged fish. Despite these numbers being lower than expected, we were happy to see that the ratio between pit tagged and temperature tagged fish is the same, indicating that the more invasive surgery associated with temperature tagging didn't impact survival. And because recapture rate was lower than we had hoped, we also brought back several untagged fish to increase our sample size when measuring thermal tolerance in the lab. Stream conditions vary dramatically between the two years of our study. When we tagged fish in 2021, streams were at their typical June conditions for Western Mass streams, um, and then were impacted by a short-term drought right after. By July, on the other hand, it started to rain and seemingly did not stop raining all summer, leading to all of our study areas being in flood stage for the duration of our 2021 field season. In contrast, in 2022, when we tag fish again at typical stream stage, um, but then the whole region quickly fell into extreme drought conditions. Shown here is Underhill Brook, and we're pretty low down in the system. You can just barely see the Quabbin Reservoir a couple hundred meters downstream. Um, Underhill Brook became a series of pools loosely connected by shallow riffles. Um, and even worse, Upper Dry Brook became a series of isolated pools, many of which had dried up completely by August. In all the plots for the duration of the presentation, the order in which the streams are plotted will be the same. Coldest on the left, warmest on the right. The variation in stream flow conditions across years led to variation in stream temperature across years. 
We saw that under flood conditions, Upper Dry Brook and Upper Lyons Brook were much warmer than under drought conditions. This is likely because under drought conditions, the streams are dominated by cold groundwater input, while under flood conditions, rubble ponds spill heated surface water into Lyons Brook, thereby increasing the temperature. Then looking here at Lower Lyons Brook, we see that likely because of cold groundwater input along the way, by the time the water from Upper Lyons Brook reached Upper, our Upper Lyons Brook study site reached Lower Lyons Brook, the stream had cooled um, and that pattern persisted for both years. And this is um, likely, uh, this is likely from um, high groundwater input along the way. Meanwhile, at Upper Dry Brook in 2022 um, was much colder under drought conditions, but increased over the summer, likely as the pools became too small and the warmer ambient air had a larger influence on the diminishing amount of groundwater input. Um, but overall, still much colder than our other three sites. I'm sorry, other, uh, yeah, other three streams. And just to remind you um, about the chronic stress and lethal temperatures um, I talked about earlier, 22 degrees being chronic stress and 25 thought to being lethal. And just to show you how our streams um, lined up with those um, thresholds. So as we expected, differences in stream temperature led to differences in thermal tolerance. On this plot, we see that Upper Lyons had the highest thermal tolerance values in both years, and Drybrook, which was the coldest of the study areas, had the lowest thermal tolerance values. But note that the Upper and, liar, upper and Lower Drybrook swat, sites swapped order and thermal tolerance as stream conditions were different across years. This reordering of thermal tolerance at Drybrook was likely due to interannual inter variation and acclimation response. In the next series of plots, time will be on the x-axis <clears throat> and water temperature will be on the y-axis. Each panel um, is, an, is the water temperature that an individual fish experienced. And shown here is 2021 and um, some 22, 2022 data that we've collected so far. The real value of this study is that one, it's one of the first studies where we can see what water temperature fish actually experienced in the wild. Rather than just estimating thermal experience from stream temperature uh, and relating that experience to thermal performance in the lab, in this study, we, we can relate actual individual thermal history with thermal performance. In the interest of time, I'm only gonna show individual data from the coldest site, shown here as Lower Dry Brook, and subsequently the warmest site. At Lower Dry Brook, stream temperatures are really cold. Um, we can see maximum temperatures um, around 19 degrees. Um, so the fish there really didn't have to move or adapt. For the most part, they just experienced whatever the temperature of the brook was. And so now I'm going to zoom in on these two fish first, and then in a subsequent graph, look at this fish here um, that seemed to experience a lot of thermal variability, just like these other two fish from 2022. When we look at these two fish from 2021, and we add stream temperature, which is the black dot, um, the point that they just did whatever the stream was doing is reinforced by the lack of deviation of fish temperature from stream temperature. If anything, this fish here on the right shows some minimal, minimal amount of preference for warm water in July and then again in August. And then we also see if we just look at the averages, the average stream temperature over the summer was 14.4 degrees and the average temperature each fish experienced over that time period was 14.3 degrees, so not very different. And then if we look at that fish from 2022, that seemed to have a lot of fluctuation. Um, we do see that the individual did experience daily fluctuations in thermal conditions, but its thermal experience was identical to stream conditions. So again, a mean stream temperature of 14.7 degrees and a mean fish experience temperature of 14.7 degrees. So if all fish and all streams behaved like this, where average thermal experience of fish matches the average stream temperature, broad scale models would work really well. In contrast to the much colder dry brook um, at Upper Lyons, we saw that individual thermal experience was much warmer. Because we knew Upper Lyons to be a warm stream, this is the one site where we really expected to see cold water refuge seeking behavior. 
However, we are very surprised to see fish routinely experiencing 25 degrees and sometimes experiencing water temperatures as high as 28 degrees. And just to remind you, these are fish that survive these temp uh, that experience these temperatures and survived until we collected them in the fall. And again, I'm going to zoom in first into these two fish here from 2021 and then zoom in on a separate plot to this fish in 2022 um, because it looks like it's doing something very different than the other fish collected at Upper Lions Brook. But just at those first two fish from 2021, and again, adding stream temperature as the black dots, um, we do say both of these fish did tend to not experience the most extremely warm events here in mid-August, uh, mid um, but they, but the fish on the left showed that it found cold water, but it pretty quickly left that cold water to head back to warm water. The fish on the right did show a slightly higher preference for cooler water over that same time period, but just like the first fish, it did not seem to seek out in favor of the much colder groundwater inputs that we knew were there. And again, if we just look at averages, the average stream temperature over that time period was 20.8 degrees, and the mean tag temperatures were 20.6 and 20.1. So cooler, um, but not that much cooler. When we look more closely at that one temperature tag from 2022, we do see a much higher degree of cold water refuge seeking behavior, particularly from the end of June until mid-August. This fish was tagged directly below Ruggles Pond, but was recaptured in the fall about two kilometers further downstream. Because we don't know the location of our tag fish in the stream, we don't know if the change in the degree of uh, refuge seeking behavior here after mid-August is due to apparent cooling of Lions Brook, or if this is when the fish moved downstream. Um, and if we just look at averages across this time period, Again, they don't seem very different. Average stream temperature was 18.7 and the average uh, fish experience was 18.5. But if we break the summer into pieces and we look just at this time period where it was experienced, where it seems to be experiencing cold water refuge seeking behavior, we see that its average temperature now is almost a degree cooler, whereas later in the summer and into the fall, the temperatures were almost identical. Now, if we zoom in to the hottest part of the summer and we look at um, this thermal refuge seeking behavior, um, we see that at the end of, uh, yeah, we look at, we see sub daily movements um, and that the fish experience was roughly two degrees cooler than the mean stream temperature. We also see there's a lot of variation in stream temperature over just a few hundred meters when we plot all eight temperature loggers. Um, which are shown uh, here in the lighter lines, the mean temperature for all eight loggers is this dark black line. And the fish experience is this purple line. Uh, yeah, so we see that even with eight loggers, we still don't characterize the cold water refugia that this fish was using. Um, further, if we examine this, we see that every night the fish moved a really warm water in the brook um, possibly to feed. And then as soon as the sun came up, the fish moved somewhere um, into water that was as much as 10 degrees cooler. So at night up into warm water and then every morning right back down into cooler water. Because we have individual data, we can now relate thermal histories of wild fish to thermal performance in the lab. What we see is that what we see is that individual fish experienced the warmest temperatures in the wild displayed the highest thermal tolerance in the lab. So our warmest fish from Upper Dry Brook or Upper Lions Brook here, and our coldest fish from Lower Dry Brook here. There is this one Lower Dry Brook fish here that had a maximum temperature experienced in the wild of 22 degrees. But while most of these fish like the ones here at Upper Dry Brook experienced those maximum temperatures several times or spent most of the, uh, most of the summer just below that maximum temperature, this fish actually only experienced 22 degrees uh, twice throughout the summer and spent most of its time um, below 20 degrees. And before I hand off to Amy, I have a few final thoughts in summary. Um, we saw that thermal conditions varied across our study areas and that stream temperature was influenced by the occurrence of extreme flood and drought conditions. Even when we didn't measure thermal variability directly by deploying lots and lots of stream temperature loggers, 
we did see that individual fish occupied warmer and colder than average based uh, average stream temperatures based on stream, stream temperatures alone. For example, the upper lined brook fish that I just showed. So we know there was cold water refugia available. Some fish use it, sometimes even just briefly, but also in warm streams, fish occupied warmer than expected water indicating an acclimation response or possibly um, adaptation to increased stream temperatures. And finally, we saw that fish experienced much warmer thermal conditions than was conventionally thought to be possible, and that thermal history of individual fish in the wild did influence thermal performance in the lab. And before I hand it over to Amy, um, I would like to thank the NECASC and Mass Wildlife again for funding for this project. Um, also would really like to thank our project collab collaborators, Steve and Ben, and especially Becca um, Canonies from Mass Wildlife. Um, Becca helped us secure the funding, and she also put me in touch with all these people from Mass Wildlife and Mass DCR who helped out in the field. And we would also especially like to thank all the help we received here at Conti. And with that, I will turn it over to Amy. Yes. Okay. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, I um, we were really excited to see some of this data and some of it still rolling in. So um, I, I would like to thank um, Annie Cask for the opportunity to share some more of this data. And um, I'd like to focus on, as Matt said, the lab portion of the studies that we conducted once we brought fish back to the lab. Specifically, I'll talk more about thermal tolerance, um, growth, and physiological response. Um, Temperature through its effects on individual physiology is a dominant driver of species ecology and biogeography. And understanding its impact on animal performance has been a goal of environmental physiologists for decades. Um, climate change has focused renewed interest on understanding this relationship between physiology and distribution. Um, for ectotherms, changing temperature causes changes in biochemical processes and metabolism that must be compensated for in order to maintain performance. So overcoming the load induced by a multiple stressor environment might be difficult under normal conditions, um, but will be even more complicated in warmer world um, due to limitations in the energy available. So this study provided a unique opportunity to directly evaluate wild fish where detailed thermal histories can be connected to thermal performance and physiological condition. Um, uh, again, Matt showed you this slide several times. Um, I'm gonna start with the um, CT max, the critical thermal maximum one again, just for review. Um, CT max is the most widely used test for predicting thermal tolerance and may reflect capacity to survive extreme temperatures. Um, as Matt said, our test uses a two degree per hour ramp. Um, and um, by recording temperature and time, we are able to measure cumulative temperature, which really does add fine resolution to loss of equilibrium data. Um, this You've seen this graph with lower dry brook, the coldest site, um, having the lowest thermal tolerance. Um, and just as a point of reference, the, the average loss of equilibrium temperatures here are on the right um, with only um, one degree difference, about one degree C difference between the lowest and the warmest. So you can see that um, by using cumulative um, temperature time data, we really do add a finer point to this. There, um, there is notable variability among these um, fish, especially the two streams with the most extreme temperatures, um, the lower dry and upper lines. And this may reflect the heterogeneity of stream temperatures and 
um, thermal experience and individual tolerances. So this, this represents all of the fish, whether um, they were tagged or not. Now with CT max, um, after they lose equilibrium and roll over, we drop them directly into cold water. And surprisingly, um, in our hands, at least with laboratory fish, they are there's usually few, if any, direct mortalities, even though they've had this huge temperature shift. Um, because they recover, we can run repeat tolerance tests on the same individuals. Um, based on several lab studies conducted, we know they lose acclimation, as Matt said, in 42 days. And so to eliminate the potential for thermal acclimation differences, we recovered these fish for 60 days um, in individual tanks in the wet lab um, to make sure that we've uh, allowed time for loss of acclimation. Um, CT max, so then we re-ran the CT max test for time two after 60 days. On the left is again CT max time one and on the right is time two. Um, you can see that there is some reduction in thermal tolerance across all groups. Um, and But however, the trend still holds. There, um, you should note that there were some losses um, throughout the study. So we do not have um, data for the coldest stream at lower dry. So the fact that with loss of that, with acclimation um, not being counted for here, um, this suggests that differences in thermal tolerance may be driven by something other than just acclimation and thermal history and suggest that some adaptation, either genetic or epigenetic or a combination is occurring here. When we um, compare CT max at time one and time two, for only the fish that we have um, data on, so these are only tagged fish, um, both pit tags and thermal tags, um, you can see that there is a tight correlation and that um, they're fairly consistent by individual. So these fish are acclimating and likely adapting to warm and cold streams. How is this affecting growth? We know that temperature affects growth via its effects on the energy budget and the investment of surplus energy into reproduction and growth. So under stressful conditions, resources are diverted from growth and reproduction to survival. Um, from previous studies that we've done at Conti on hatchery origin brook trout um, that were held at constant temperatures, we know that prolonged high temperature impacts growth rate with decreasing growth at temperatures above 16 degrees and negative growth um, at 24 degrees with an estimated upper thermal limit for positive growth of 23 degrees. So we looked at specific growth rate of thermally tagged fish from all of these sites in 2021. And um, specific growth rate are the boxes and the circles are the maximum temperature um, that the fish experienced. Um, you can see that their range, the specific growth range is quite narrow um, in comparison to laboratory fish, which is not unexpected. Um, but there does not seem to be a pattern um, where specific growth rate follows temperature. And even though these fish um, did spend a significant amount of time at temperatures that are considered to be inhibitory to growth. However, um, there just, there's so much data here, it's really interesting. If you look more closely at Underhill Brook, um, there, where they had the lowest specific growth rate, and if you look at what they did in the stream in 2021, so these are all individual fish, um, and with the same format, with the black being water temperature, and the colors are um, individual fish temperatures, that the fish really did not have as much um, use of refugia as, say, lion, as the fish that Matt showed you from upper lines. Um, therefore, we may have seen a lower growth rate in underhill 
due to it, the increased metabolic cost of surviving in warmer water, which was, was often close to 22 degrees. Since growth is inhibited under stressful conditions and we know warm water is stressful to cold fish, we wanted to examine some stress markers in these fish. But first, a quick overview of the stress response. Um, stressors are perceived by the brain um, and they, that initiates a cascade of signaling that results in um, the biosynthesis and release of cortisol, which is the primary stress hormone in vertebrates into circulation. And in the short term, this is, a, a, this is an adaptive response and it has positive effects such as mobilization of energy um, for fight or flight, suppression of the immune system and refolding of damaged proteins. However, when stress becomes chronic, um, in the long term, negative effects occur, including growth inhibition, reproductive delay, and other behavioral alterations. So again, based on lab studies on brook trout, we learned that um, above 21 degrees elevated temperatures are stressful to brook trout as measured by cord circulating cord cortisol. Um, also, we found that heat shock protein 70, which is a cellular protein that is elevated um, when heat or other stressors damages proteins within cells. And HSP70 um, repairs those damaged proteins by refolding them or tagging them from removal. Um, and HSP70 was also elevated uh, above 21 degrees. So we were interested to know if the remaining fish exhibited differing physiological responses to uh, thermal stress. Um, we conducted a test, um, a sublethal thermal challenge test. Um, it's, it's held at a stressful temperature, but not lethal, and is meant to challenge them without pushing them to lethal limits. Um, and because temperature acclimation was common across all treatment groups, um, we expect that the physiological metrics that stand out may be indicative of thermal adaptation. So after 21 days of recovery from the second CT max, we ramped the fish from 16 to 23 degrees um, at four degrees an hour and then held them there for four hours. And this was followed by uh, lethal sampling. Uh, studies that evaluate temperature stress in fish in both the lab and the wild um, have measured endpoints that are thought to be predictive of thermal experience and describe mechanistic pathways that allow thermal tolerance. Um, however, there is no consistent metric that has been determined across species and across studies. Even within Salmonid specific thermal studies, there is no consensus about what are the most important physiological endpoints. Um, we've measured many of these parameters um, based on what we've done in the lab and existing literature, um, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'll focus on four physiological endpoints. So um, we've discussed cortisol and muscle heat shock protein 70 and their role in the stress response. Um, plasma glucose, which is considered a secondary stress response, um, is a, an immediate and efficient source of energy under acute stress. Um, whereas plasma lactate, um, also part of secondary stress response is um, an indicator of anaerobic metabol metabolism and is uh, less efficient and more characteristic of severe stress. So for these next four slides um, with physiological endpoints, the bar graphs on the left represent all fish um, at each site with the physiological um, endpoint on the y-axis. And the, the graphs on the right um, are only fish where we had um, 
tagged tag information. So this is CT max at time one, the loss of equilibrium temperature or cumulative temperature and the physiological matrix on, on the y-axis again. So um, in response to short-term thermal challenge at 23 degrees, cortisol is significantly lower in the coldest stream at Dry Brook as compared to Lyons, Underhill, and Upper Lyons, all warmer streams. Um, although lower cortisol may suggest less perceived stress, it may also be a maladaptive response in that a short-term regulatory stress re response would speed up returns to homeostatic norms. So, and failure to do so uh, could result in lower long-term fitness. So next we looked at heat shock protein 70 and there were no clear differences observed um, in induction and expression of heat shock protein. Uh, this indicates that cellular damaging is occurring at 23 degrees in fish from all sites. Um, we had postulated that there may be difference in the upregulation of this heat shock protein mechanism between the streams based on their thermal histories. However, all fish showed relatively high expression um, indicating cellular damage. And it's likely that HSP70 regulation is not the mechanism responsible for increased thermal tolerance. However, it is a useful biomarker for heat stress and cellular damage. Um, plasma glucose also was similar um, between all sites. Um, <clears throat> although when you add in thermal tolerance data, um, there, there is a trend for lower glucose at higher stream temperatures. However, it's not significant with these few samples. All fish um, had glucose levels within the range expected for moderately stressed brook trout. Um, and increased numbers and the time course would help us understand this glucose response. And finally, plasma lactate um, is clearly related to temperature, suggesting that cold adapted animals at higher temperatures are having a harder time um, processing um, and end up elevating this inefficient um, lactate metabolism, whereas warm adapted fish are operating more efficiently with lower um, plasma lactate. Um, I'd like to conclude with some uh, reiterate the points that Matt made in his summary slide, and then um, some of the conclusions we have from this lab data. Um, thermal heterogeneity exists between and within streams and varies with condition and is not character well characterized by temp loggers alone. Um, fish thermal experience reveals occupancy at much warmer temperatures than expected, and their experience also clearly defines refugia use that is missed by temp loggers. Um, thermal tolerance as characterized by CT max varied both among and within streams and was influenced by thermal history. Um, repeated thermal tolerance tests show evidence for both acclimation and adaptation. Um, growth rate rates are not tightly linked to thermal history alone, however, may be influenced by the availability of thermal refugia. Um, physiological metrics are informed by thermal tolerance and higher temperature tolerance in warm streams is associated, associated with lower plasma lactate indicating greater efficiency of warm adapted fish under temper, temperature challenge. Um, so where to go in the future? Um, you can see that there's a lot of data that we um, still can look at individual, um, individual thermal histories in relation to behavior growth and physiology um, and thermal tolerance. Um, we also have collected samples for genetic and epigenetic studies to help to um, elucidate the pathways um, and mechanisms involved in thermal tolerance. Um, 
and on a broader scale, linking um, flow extremes, temperature, um, and drought, and understanding these patterns in relation to persistence, and finally, characterization of refugia using multiple criteria. So again, thank you. Um, uh, these are all the same people that Matt thanked, and, and um, in addition, um, the physiology group, which is not all represented here, uh, played a large role in, in helping with the laboratory portion of this study. So with that, Matt and I would be happy to take any questions.